Hello and welcome to the Star Trek Wars podcast, Picard edition. I'm your co-host Jordan, and joining me as always in our new synthetic bodies that are exactly identical to our old bodies, it's Jocelyn. Hey. And we may be a new podcast that you look very... I can't stop crazy. touching my face. <laughs> oh, man. Well, Jocelyn, Star Trek Picard is back, and so is mm-hmm. kind of the new age of Star Trek, where we will have five Star Trek shows streaming this year on Paramount. Amazing. Three live action and two animated, which is pretty incredible. And incredible. this week, we have also reviewed Star Trek Discovery, season four, episode 11. So that is winding down as Picard kicks off. And I was just thinking how like this is one of the most exciting times of Star Trek, just since I've been a teenager and not so much Enterprise. Enterprise was kind of on an island. We had the movies going on, then Enterprise. But really yeah. going back to Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, the time where you kind of had three live-action Trek shows on at almost the same time. Mm-hmm. And it's just really cool to be back in that point because I was actually looking at my notes for Star Trek Picard finale, uh, which took place, I believe, in March of 2020. So two yes. full years ago. Picard's season one was over two years ago. It was a it different debuted. time. It was it a different time. It feels like 20 years ago. <laughs> but I was reading through my notes, and in my notes it said, you know, join us on the Star Trek Wars podcast. We're reviewing the seventh season of Star Trek Voyager, Voyager and Deep Space Nine. And I was like, holy wow. cow. Like, it's been... It's been a minute. It's, it's been a while. And two years seems like such a short time in some ways and such a long time in others. Like, I can't believe it's been over two years since we started doing Picard coverage. So we're excited to be talking about the premiere and what a premiere it was. Uh, Picard season two, episode one, The Stargazer, which is uh, pretty clever. I see what you did there. I see what they did there, yeah. <laughs> it's written by Terry Metalis and directed by Douglas Aronikowski. Starfleet must once again call on the legendary John Luke Picard after members of his former crew, Cristobal Rios, Seven of Nine, Rafi Musiker, and Dr. Agnes Gerardi discover an anomaly in space that threatens the galaxy. So, Jocelyn, the band's pretty much all back together again. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about kind of your first impressions of the Picard premiere and uh, what you thought about episode one. Um, I thought they came out swinging. I thought this was a, a really strong episode and set up what could be like a really exciting, cool season. Um. I do have some caveats to that. I do have some con- concerns, but mostly, um, yeah, I'm into it. I'm excited. I like it. Yeah, I I felt this episode started off fast-paced and kind of action-packed, which is not always how you describe Star Trek, and it's not always made mm-hmm. for the best Star Trek, but I felt that It's a really good mix of action and intrigue and backstory and catch up with the characters and setting up the season. So for a first episode of a season, I think this is almost as good as you can get. And, you know, coming off of last season, which I felt the finale, the last two episodes were a little underwhelming, not terrible, but the whole Picard, Gollum, body thing just didn't add much. And it doesn't really add much so far to season two. I doubt it'll really be touched on too much. I think they've forgotten about it. Which is, I think, best. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, just a really action-packed beginning. Like I said, this is just a really exciting time for Star Trek. And I think it was really important that they nailed the first episode. Because a lot of people, you know, had given up on Discovery, or even Picard after the first season. So they say. People say that they don't like it. And as we'll find out, they write reviews of a show that's 11 episodes into the fourth season, and they're still writing reviews every week about the show yeah, that they're watching. Yeah, telling people to stop watching it. Exactly. Which feels like a good time to remind people that just because people are writing reviews of a show does not mean that they are watching it. Not always. This is true. But we did so. watch this week's episode of Picard, and let's talk about our oh, pros yeah. and what you liked about the I liked. Answer. I liked a lot. I liked that the episode started out in the action and you were kind of confused by what was going on. They didn't do a big reveal of the Borg Queen attacking the ship. They, you just kind of saw some tentacles. You, you saw some firing. You saw some 
Vulcan blood, you know, and you just were like, why are they all together on this bridge? Why are they being attacked? It just, I like when they do that. I know it's kind of a trope at this point to start at the height of the action. And then the rest of the episode is a build up to that moment, but it works. It works every time, which is why people do it. And it worked this time. Um, yeah, it, it worked I th- well. And I almost thought, I was glad that that's the route they took because I almost had the feeling the way that it started. I was like, oh, well, that didn't happen. I thought it was a Picard dream, like at the beginning of First Contact, where it's a dream and then he wakes up, right. but he's not really awake and it's a dream. Which is so disappointing if that were it the case. And then they didn't disappoint us. Though. Exactly. Which was nice. I think we even got a new title sequence, didn't we? We did, yeah. Even the music was slightly different. It, the music it was slightly different. A little more distressed and frantic, and then it ramps yeah. up, and that's kind of the same. And then it twists back into, you know, a yeah, slightly different of version, which was uh, yeah. very good. And even with the, like, the care they take in the title sequence to yeah. kind of parallel it Tie to in the, the season, season and what we're going to see. Yeah. So I thought that was cool. Um, clearly a lot, like a lot of efforts going to this, um, Picard continues his reign as the sweater King and I'm here for it. I love a good cable knit. I love a good earth tone green. I just, I love his style. He is a million years old and, uh, more on that in the cons, but. And he owns just, it though. He owns it. Let me, let me just be very clear. Uh, Jean-Luc Picard is almost 100 years old. However, he can still get it. I just want everyone to understand that, first off. If he wanted it. Uh, I think he does, but, you know. Um, it, it's in question because of what they're setting up. I mean, more on that in the cons. Anyway, uh, someone who can also get it, probably for the rest of her life, is Seven of Nine, Jerry Ryan, who is the gift... That just keeps on giving. She and also and very strong sweater game. Also very strong sweater game. Very strong jacket game. Very strong like hip built accessories game. I I just everything about her look I love. I love her expressions. I love her in action. I love that she's taken over the La Serena. I love that she has disabled <laughs> every one of the, um, the hologram. holograms except the like the one that doesn't I don't speak even, English. Yeah, the Amic. one that is the most mouthy. I think um, I liked it. I liked that a lot. Um, there is a lot of aesthetically pleasing moments in this episode, and not the least of which are the the Borg. That, oh my God, the new Borg look, the from the ship to the queen, is insanely good. Just insanely good. It, it, it is consistent with what we know of the Borg, that it's all like mostly machinery. But like even in that mask that she's wearing, you have like a grid pattern and then you have all of these tiny like things happening like and moving behind. It just is so cool. It's so detailed. There's so much going on in the detail, but when you then it looks good f- close up and far away. I don't know. I just they showed that and I was like, that is one of the most impactful reveals you know what i mean they build it up and they build it up you know you're gonna meet the queen and then like sometimes you're disappointed when you actually see what they're building up to and this one like paid off big time so yeah it's very very cool design for sure oh my god so cool so cool everything just looks cool the stargazer looked cool i thought everything Mm -hmm. looks cool the only thing that doesn't look cool is rios and we'll get to that in the cons because annoys me. Um, neutral zone wise, I cannot wait for my local target to start selling Chateau Picard wine. And, uh, I feel like it's going to be pretty good. So just putting that out there. Um, there's a lot of money to be made. (laughs) I mean, even Snoop Dogg has wine. It is not great, but it's there. Um, with that classic green glow, in this like space anomaly that just shows up 
and like the the horde of of voices speaking in unison and no one not a single person was like hmm maybe this is the borg no one like put that together yeah it's pretty disappointing that seems a little uh i don't know about that also my last neutral zone when i first saw q i was like oh it's the q continuum and then i was like it's the q continuum because, like, yay, the Q continuum, but also the Q continuum, guys. Are we just going to, are we going to do that? Really? I don't know. I'm glad to see him. Q, Q's a good time. He's fun, but Q is at his best in one-off episodes. Coming to wreak havoc. And to cause chaos, and then he's gone. I don't know that I... I just don't know how I feel about an entire season where Q is the driving force moving the plot forward. I just don't know. I don't, they're going to have to win me over on that one. It's, it's, it's a neutral zone. It's just, I'm not, like, saying I'm not going to like it, but I, I'm very suspicious. There is a bit of a... Star Trek The Next Generation's Greatest Hits feel to the way this is set up. It's like, what do fans love? They love Q. They love the Borg. And they love the Borg. They love Seven of Nine. And they They love love Seven of Nine. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but it's not a bad idea to start with the best and kind of combine some of those elements. So I'm, I'm interested to see where they go with it. I doubt we see Q every week. I think it's kind of Q sets this in motion. Picard and him will have a conversation, then we'll go a couple weeks without seeing him. Yeah. And, you know, I think it'll lead back into Q, obviously, but um, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting for sure. Overall, I'm, I'm like really excited about this alternate timeline thing. I am overall like very strong outing, very strong introduction to the season. But what did you think, Jordan? What are your pros? I agree. I think that they started off really fast paced. There's a little bit of catch up to do, but they also did a smart thing, which I used to be opposed to, but don't really care about anymore is jumping forward in time. Um, yeah. About a year and a half, because if you just do this in real time, then there's so much that you have to do. You can jump forward, you can fill some holes and then you can tell kind of backstory on what we missed. Yeah. It's a convenient, you know, storytelling device, but it's very effective and it gets you to the point where you need to be. Because it is, it's so weird in shows where like some traumatic, cataclysmic event takes place and then the next season starts a week later and there's another gigantic cataclysmic event taking place. So this, at least spacing it out a little bit, makes it more intriguing. Now you can have Rios being where he is. You can have Elnor graduating at a very um, expedited rate, I might add. Yeah. And then, you know, you can kind of set all this up. And then you also throw in little bits of characters dying off screen so that Picard can maybe hook up. So we'll get into that. <laughs> but We'll get more into that in my cons. Yeah. I, I could see, like, the writer's room. They have Patrick Stewart come in because he's a big part of this. It's like, okay, Patrick, what would you like uh, this season? Do you want, you know, a more comfortable trailer? Do you need, you know, some more Earl Grey? It's like, well, Shaban. You're like, yes, what, you, more Shaban? Kill him. What? No, Shaban, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm kind of into his girl, so. <laughs> yeah, I kind of really pulling a King David there, uh, Picard. No joke. So just a really action-packed beginning. I thought it was a good way to start this and kind of throwing us in, being like, whoa, what the heck's going on? Showing us what we want to see, but just a little bit of it, and then leading back up to that was smart. Because last season started off very slowly but there you had 20 right. years of backstory to kind of tr- try to fill in and a lot right. of characters to introduce so this is a really expedited reintroduction and it focused on the primary you know character of Picard but Seven gets her moment Rios gets some mm-hmm. moments so we get to see all these characters and I just thought the pacing was really good I thought just overall it was crafted very well and it did more than the probably the first three episodes of the first season of Picard and yeah. probably more than eight or nine episodes of Discovery have done so far this season. <laughs> so it, it was also really nice for me just seeing Picard enjoying his vineyard for once. Because I feel like 
the vineyard, every time we go there, whether it be in family or in the first season of Picard, it's always like this trauma tied to it. Right. And just him not being able to relax and enjoy the fruits of his labor, if you will. But I'm I was watching this with <laughs> subtitles. So when the Picard and Laris thing uh, happened, where they're getting real close and it's like they're almost going to kiss, and then it switches to the next scene. Uh, yeah. The captions come on much earlier, like a few seconds early. So it <laughs> it goes from them almost kissing, and then they don't, but it goes from them almost kissing to uh, a black screen, and the subtitles were on the screen like I said before the next scene happened and it said heavy breathing <laughs> and I'm just like whoa what did I miss like I thought they weren't going to hook up and then it's like heavy breathing and then it totally got me and then it's like the flashback to him being a kid or whatever I was like oh my gosh oh my so god that's so they, funny they tricked me they got you good this oh, another Shania Twain reference got me good I'm gonna get you good I, sorry um, sorry I know like two of her songs <laughs> Wait, how is that possible? Because I have taste in. Music. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that that hurts. But I will. I have standards. <laughs> I will recover. This episode actually took uh, its time telling a backstory of a character that we've seen for like over a hundred and seventy-five episodes and four movies. But there's still. Mm. So much about Picard's backstory that's not explored, which is kind of amazing. Yeah. Like we get tapestry, which is a really nice backstory, and we get hints of Picard and what he's given up when we see him in the Nexus and Generations, and we see him in Family go back. But there's so much mm-hmm. about Picard's family that is just left unexplored. Yeah. Um, and just even his early command. I mean, the episode is titled "Stargazer." Two words clever because his ship is called the stargazer that was his first command Mm -hmm. so it was really cool to see the stargazer for one which was a little confusing to me because it's a new class of ship but he also said it's a refit of his old ship which doesn't make sense and there's no like hyphenation like it's not the stargazer a or the stargazer b so it's like a new ship but he made it sound like it was a refit of his old ship so Mm. um, it seems like it's just a completely new ship with the name the stargazer on it yeah, and it looks roughly like the old Stargazer. Updated. Uh, the old Stargazer. It's got the four nacelles and. Kind of like a. Those machines that the janitors use to polish the floors. Like it's this huge base with like a small oh, handle on top. Yeah, kind of like that. Um, but yeah, this, you have the, the four nacelles, a much more modern, more streamlined look. The Stargazer was mm-hmm. not a, a particularly pretty ship. And I believe Picard even, uh, I, had a, I had the quote of what he said about the Stargazer. Because they, they mentioned the Stargazer probably three or four times throughout the show's run. But he said that it was oh, yeah. an overworked, underpowered vessel, always on the verge of flying apart at the seams. So oh, he's okay. So it sounds thing. like a real beat up old ship. Pretty much. So that's why it's his first command, you know. It's just kind of yeah. like that. That little engine that could. Prove yourself. He's talking about yeah. it to, I think, Scotty. But I would have loved to have seen more flashbacks of his time on the Stargazer. And there are some books and things like that. But I wouldn't mind this season if we see, you know, Picard on the Stargazer. And that's where, you know, Jack Crusher, that's where he meets the Crusher family. And that's where yeah. his relationship with, you know, Beverly starts and with, um, well, Wheaton, Wesley. So I just feel like that's a very unexplored portion of Picard's past. Mm-hmm. He also, I believe, takes command after the captain of the Stargazer gets killed in action. It's like, that would be a cool flashback to see him taking the captain's seat for the first time after the captain's that killed. That would be cool. And anyways, but for I sure. felt um, Picard's speech was very good, where he's talking about the final frontier and time. Mm-hmm. It's really nice to actually just see a captain give a speech. Um, sorry again, I'm referencing Star Trek Enterprise. <laughs> Which we'll watch, you'll watch someday soon. Seven, really just getting to yeah. kick some butt was cool. We get to see her yeah. on the ship, and she's been doing Fenris Ranger stuff. So kind of like Jeremy said, Reno doing Reno things. Like Seven doing seven things. She's just yeah. kicking butt, taking names. And mm-hmm. she's taking up this mantle of kind of being this ranger and do-gooder. And hopefully the Federation will be 
more in line with her ideals going forward, and she can re enlist, or maybe she just becomes a vigilante. I'm fine with whatever she does. Uh, the hologram, uh, Emic is being a security guard, like that makes perfect sense. If you think about a use for holograms in mm-hmm. Star Trek, practically, holograms would be great because you could shoot phasers through them and then she just activates great this, security guard, turns off the safety protocols, and he beats the guy up or whatever. Yeah. So, even like we talk about detail with the opening credits and all that, but even just like the transporter sound effects on the ship sounded very much like a slightly modified version of the TNG transporter. Um, mm-hmm. So, I really dig that. The Federation ships, I felt, looked like a futuristic TNG-style starship, like a slightly more modern take on the Enterprise-E, which is probably the most modern that we've gotten so far. But Mm -hmm. they did not look all white interiors. They didn't look like an Apple store. Like They looked like TNG era, but just slightly updated. And it was just the perfect styling, and it looked like I felt like I was on a starship, and I felt like I was in Star Trek, because there were people on starships in Starfleet uniforms that looked like Star Trek, so it just felt like being right. at home in a way. Um, I talked about the, the Stargazer. In the flashback scenes, I'd love to see, like, a de-aged Picard, to see him, you know, kind of in his that prime, maybe cool. even with a little hair, because he allegedly had hair back in the day, as we see. Allegedly. Um, in his in his picture, uh, Q showing up looking as young as the day we met him, and then mm-hmm. catching up with Picard with like the snap of his finger is just perfect. And the most Q thing and the CGI was incredible on that. Like they really, it's really good. Nailed. I think John Delancey looked younger in that than he ever has in Star Trek, even like in <laughs> in the eighties. Yeah, even when he was, yeah, even young, when he yeah. was young. So <laughs> kudos to him. Uh, and just overall, a really good way. To start the season. And mm-hmm. can't really say too much about the characters. Like, Soji does not have a ton to do in this episode. Elnor has very little. Rafi has a few lines. But I think yeah. they did enough and showed us... It basically just put the chess pieces on the board. You know, like uh, like we referenced in the last episode of, you know, setting up the finale. This sets up the whole season and it does it really well. Now they have to execute yeah. that, but I have much more faith in them after seeing this episode than I did probably going into it. Yeah. Because I like the same. first season, but I think the second season has a lot more potential. And uh, I mean, that might have been the best episode of Picard that we've seen yet. So I think so. And I think you're talking about the characters. One thing that I forgot to mention in my pros is Dr. Girardi, mm-hmm. who I have never liked mm-hmm. and who I still do not understand why she's not in prison. Um, Temporary temporary insanity. insanity. I, they gave her more personality in this episode. I understand her and like her more from this episode than I did all last season. She's broken up with Rios. She's the way that she said she'd been exonerated made it seem like she still feels guilty. And she's, uh, She's drinking, she's hitting the bottle pretty hard. And that makes me like her more for some reason. Mm-hmm. I wonder. So, I wonder. yeah. Well, uh, neutral zone wise, I, I don't think Picard would allow all of the automation on his vineyard. Like, I'll let it slide because he's getting up there in mm. years, but I kind of recall him talking about it in TNG. Where his family was very much like, do it with your hands, and they didn't allow you, automation. You don't think he would he would allow the transporting the of the flying, drinks directly transporting. off the vine? No. Yeah. I think that's ridiculous. Mm. I, I mean, trust me, if I had a vineyard, I'm using the transporting ships. Like, I, Absolutely. I'll use my hands, too, but, I mean, if it's faster. Uh, Absolutely. All the technology. I'll use it. I mentioned in my pros Picard's speech, but I... It's almost a con because he missed an opportunity in his speech to refer to time as the fire in which we burn. Which, uh, <laughs> anyways, I didn't think I'd reference Star Trek Generation so much. Wow. Especially in my pros. Uh, a lot of subtitles uh, this week for a show with a universal translator. There's a lot of use of, like, Picard and Loris. Their thing is that they say other... Um, they use other languages to say things, and I guess they're like quizzing each other on other languages, mm-hmm. which 
that was fine. And then Gerardi's talking to the Deltons, and then it's fine. I think it's it's actually good, but um, I just noticed that I was actually watching it with subtitles at one point, so it was weird that there was, when I watched it without subtitles, that there was still so much subtitles on the screen when you yeah, have subtitles. a universal translator. But they explain why Agnes isn't in jail, which is a bit of a thin reason. But yes. I'll put it as neutral zone because they had to do it, and they did. Because a yeah. lot of shows would just gloss they, they over it. They can't put her in jail. Well, and they can't not explain why she's not in jail. Exactly. Because she objectively deserves to be in jail, but sure. was exonerated, so. I also feel that That's cool. Rios looks like he changed out of his loner freighter clothes and just slipped into a captain's uniform. Like, uh, well, nothing changed in comes. two years. They're just like, he I goes know. straight from, like, hey, we need you as a captain. He put on his uniform. Nothing changed at all. He still got the cigar. Which is, I mean, a cigar is like a cool thing, but I don't see like a Federation captain on the bridge having a cigar in his mouth. Just when has a cigar been a cool thing? Have you ever been around a cigar? Yes. Yeah. They smell gross. No, no, some cigars smell good. Well, maybe distilled into like a perfume or something, but I've never been around someone smoking a cigar and been like, yeah, that guy's cool. Really? Okay. I think cigars are viewed as a cool thing. Maybe yeah. more of a masculine thing, but like if you watch anything from like the 60s or 70s, like the cool guy has a cigar. Kind of like right. smoking and, was viewed as a super cool thing for a long exactly. time. Exactly. That's more to my point. I feel like at this point in the future, and surely this is some kind of non-carcinogenic, like, cigar that he lights but synthetic. also never smokes. Yeah, it's synthetic. Um, I just don't ever see that still, like, having that 1950s cool vibe. It's, it's, it's like the definition of trying too hard. Yeah. It's just, I don't have a strong enough personality, so I'll have the cigar, and it will be my personality. I get that a little bit. Uh, speaking yeah. of trying too hard, this is neutral zone, yeah. and this is somewhat on, I wouldn't say it's on me, but it's somewhat just on the, the times that we live in where, like, Q showing up, not a surprise, because every single trailer showed Q showing up and mentioned Q. See, I didn't Same. watch the trailers. I wanted to be surprised. You were surprised? And I, I was shocked. Really? Okay, wow. I had no I idea. You. I had no idea... I don't watch like who's in, I don't watch the credits, uh, you know, because I don't want to see who like the guest star of the week is. Mm -hmm. Uh, The only thing that should have spoiled it for me is the garbage people at Paramount Plus put Q next to Picard in the poster Mm -hmm. to advertise the show. However, because it was the aged Q, I didn't recognize him. Oh, it was John Delancey. I didn't know who I was looking at. I didn't know it was John Delancey. Yeah, so I was not spoiled on Q at all. Now, the about- thumbnail picture for the episode was Guinan. Picard and Guinan. Yeah. So I was spoiled on Guinan, and that was disappointing to me. Well, that's the other thing I was going to lead into is Guinan. Um, I don't have a problem with Guinan in this episode, but like Patrick Stewart went on The View and asked her to be in Picard season two like two years ago. So I heard about that. And then yeah. I heard, you know, to the grapevine um, that she was going to be in this episode, which I, was not a well-kept secret by any means, because they're right. trying to get people to watch the show. So they, it's hard to not be spoiled on things. And had they're I gone pulling, into this blind... It's, yeah, it's like not what a you said, reference. Star Trek Greatest Hits. Mm-hmm. It's Q, it's Guinan, it's Picard, it's Seven. I know like a lot of fans are like, it's 10 Forward Avenue, or Forward Avenue, and address is 10. Like, that's a little on the nose for me. Like, that is... <laughs> It's okay. It's fine. But that scene it was just fine. it read more as Patrick Stewart talks to Whoopi Goldberg than Picard and Guinan to an extent. Now that Guinan mm-hmm. is a timeless character, which I felt yeah. a little it felt a little overused that Q is like, oh let me catch up. I like that. But then Guinan's like, oh, well if we choose to age, like who is yeah, going to kinda, choose Who would to- choose to age? Yeah, exactly. But they had to kind of make it happen they could have just de-aged her like they did with q i guess it would cost way way more but I, I was feeling kind of ambivalent about it and then i watched her on the on the ready room just kind of talk about how she 
got into TNG in the first place and mm-hmm. like what it meant to her and how when she was watching TOS, seeing Uhura mm-hmm. and being represented in that way. And then it kind of warmed me up more to it. Because so that's why I don't watch the ready room. I don't want to be warmed up. <laughs> I want to remain cold and dead inside. <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, the guy in the interaction was fine. And you know, it's good to see those characters. I will always say yes to seeing those beloved characters from Next Generation so much as it adds sure. something to the plot. I don't want to just see them to see them. Maybe yeah. we'll see Guyan again, but it, it didn't add a ton to the story. So it wasn't bad, but it's just kind of neutral zone right. for me. But overall, um, that, that's pretty much all the, the pros and neutral zone I have, Jocelyn. Mm. Let's, uh, let's take a quick ad break, which will be me awesome. reading an ad, uh, oh. <laughs> which I should probably pre-record. But, should I uh, which react to the ad? You should no, react you in real time as if you're hearing okay. this ad for the first time. Unspoiled. I see. Okay. But no, the ad is for us. It is for Star Trek Wars, which is a Star oh, I Trek love it podcast already. where we've been reviewing. <gasps> Essentially, it's a plug for, for Star Trek Wars. If you like Picard, you like Discovery, or any Star Trek show, you want to go back and watch Next Generation Season 4, Episode 5, we've reviewed that. We've reviewed every live-action yeah. Star Trek and every animated Star Trek, even the animated series from the 70s. Wow. And we have continuing coverage of Lower Decks with Chelsea and Jeremy. And Prodigy so with Leet and Adam, and we'll have awesome. Strange New Worlds coming up. So check out the feed. We have over 300 episodes to choose from. So Wow. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to plug our own show, because what better place to do it than here? It's also just like the greatest show. And we have a Patreon. We have a Patreon as well. So if you want to hear yeah. Chelsea go back and kind of watch out of context the top 10 Enterprise episodes, mm-hmm. so the top 10 Voyager episodes you, you definitely do want that. you can do that on patreon we've done reviews of the witcher and you know movies i think we did batman versus superman maybe I, if we did i blocked it out but all <laughs> kinds of things so, so connor jeremy <laughs> chelsea myself uh it's a good time and if, if you're mm-hmm. hungry for content we have an abundance of it so yeah Jocelyn, that being said let's move into our cons which i think will probably be a short segment but you never know. I mean, I got some, and I already spoiled the first one, which is mm. Paramount Plus. Uh, not to steal your thunder, perpetually Jordan, in the cons. Perpetually in the cons, and I know that you like to start all your cons with how horrible Paramount Plus is, but just like spoiling this episode by putting Q on the you know banner, which I didn't even recognize him, putting Guinan in the thumbnail. Like, come on, like have some insight into how people. Watch and objectively, yes, if I had watched the trailers, but I try to avoid that because I just want to watch it fresh. I don't want to be spoiled. And then I will read and watch all the extra content later. So, which I definitely did. I went and watched the trailers after this first episode, and it does look like it's going to be pretty. You know what? That's how it should be. And it is so hard in this day to do that. And I'm on Facebook and I'm a member of. Um, and I don't say that in a condescending way because you can be a member of any Facebook page uh, by just <laughs> clicking a button. But like, basically, I'm in my feed is a lot of Star Trek groups, and there's always stuff posted. And, and I feel like doing the podcast, yeah. I kind of have to be in the know, and I do want to know things, but right. I always end up being spoiled on things that I don't really want to be spoiled on. But yeah. I can't go on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter right. without seeing that stuff. So I would maybe love yeah. to just cut all that stuff out, but it's it's difficult. So I envy you in that way. I will mm-hmm. say a great example that happened this week was Brandon Sanderson, one of my favorite authors, whose book is <laughs> resting right because it is so thick. Oathbringer um, is propping up my microphone, which I should have moved so you could hear me talking. Nice. Um, so I don't have to bend down because I'm a, I'm a taller gentleman, so I use this as kind of a prop. But he came out with a YouTube video and he announced his Kickstarter for hilarious. F- four secret novels. Like through the pandemic, this guy wrote not only his regular books that he writes, which are thousands of pages of yeah. multiple series that he's writing, but then wrote four, actually five secret novels. Five. Yeah. Um, one is like a gift to his kids and then four that he's releasing and has already raised, I just, last I looked, $22 million. Um, you know, for his project, how, how dare he is just my how response, d- and that's in like the first four how days. How dare you, in a pandemic, 
make me feel like I've done nothing <laughs> because I have. And you're out there just like cranking out con- I just Yes. So it's it's the most How dare anyone be thriving right now? Kickstarter in history already in like four days. Really? And but but my my basically the point is he kept this a secret from everyone but his wife. <laughs> Even his team yeah. did not know that he was working on these novels, but he's That's also like epic. using this as a platform to um, be able to produce his own content without going through a big publisher and without going through Amazon. And good. Um, so good, good on him. him. And if you like yeah. science fiction or fantasy, check out Brandon Sanderson. Most people in that space, in that genre, already know who he is. But yeah, but his whole I thing started... is like he kept it a secret, and then he's releasing yeah. YouTube videos. Where like he hasn't even released the names of the books, and then if you want to, at the end of the video, he'll talk a little spoilery, and then he'll read like the first chapter, um, yeah. and tell you a little bit about it. But like he it's really classic. values people not being spoiled, and he's like, if you guys want to get these books in without knowing anything about them, and like do a book club amongst yourselves, like you can yeah. do that. And like it's so hard in it's today's awesome. day and age to not be spoiled on things. So I just really yeah. appreciate that. And he is my favorite author. So I just wanted to, to plug that very briefly because that happened this week and that was very exciting news. So it's, it's, it's pretty good. My gateway into Brandon Sanderson was the Mistborn series. Yeah. That's a good place. Which to I start. feel like it's a good place to start with him because it is vast. His universe is, is very vast. Yes. And then he so. ended the, the wheel of time series as well yes. and he is like he's he reads the scripts for the tv show on that and gives his feedback he's like a producer on that wow. show like how does he yeah he makes me feel inept as a human being that i can barely manage yes um work one sporting event a week uh, and, and taking my kids myself. to something yeah like that fills right. my schedule and this guy's writing six books a year and producing yeah. on it, yeah. Anyways, enough of that. I just can't with him. <laughs> but, but cons wise, Jocelyn. Back to Picard. <laughs> um, this <sighs> budding romance between Picard and Laris. I have a bud. lot of. I would like to nip this in the bud uh, because, first of all, it's never a good idea to date the help. I'm just saying, the help. creates a lot of problems. Uh, the second issue I have is Laris is like half his age. That's a problem. And as much Why is that? as much Are as you I saying can get, that his grapes have turned into raisins. <laughs> <laughs> my God! Oh my God! No, I think Picard, i.e., Patrick Stewart, has aged like a fine wine, which oh. is very well. And I'm not against, like you know. Love is love, go for it. But I'm just, I don't understand why with very well-established characters, we could not have introduced a new character that he could the Borg fall queen? in love with. And- <laughs> That's gross, Jordan. Okay, the Borg Queen is obviously his mother. Dude. I, okay. When yeah. I said love is love, I didn't mean that. Okay. okay? <laughs> If the Borg Queen is his mother, that's my last con, by the way. I'm out. We're getting this into season. that. If it, we're, that we're is where it goes, it. I am. Just, we're getting into it. Don't worry. Okay. That's my last con as well. Okay. I just I don't like this. It, this thing between he and Laris is forced. It was such a great, strong friendship that they have and a respect for each other. And now turning that into, although I appreciate the way that they're doing it, Laris is very. She's very open and very specific about her feelings and what her hopes are for their relationship. So I kind of like the way that they did that. I don't know. It just like, it just rubs me the wrong way. Well, Jocelyn, um, when a Romulan significant other dies, they have to honor that loved one by going out and hooking up with someone else and, and loving even up with stronger. Else, which I can also get behind. Um, which is why you know I'm, I'm I work out. You know, got to keep everything. Everything good for for my next love when uh, Sean goes and dies on me. Um, why is 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 young Picard dressed like he grew up in the in nineteen twenty three? Is he four hundred years old? And I just missed that. The like, Picards why are do you... a very traditional family. Like no automation, no technology. Like they three hundred live... years ago, traditional. 
Well, how much have like he looks like he just stepped off years? of the Peaky Blinders set. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of true. I, it just except it we can understand that, what he's saying. That's yes, true. <laughs> it it but it that just bothers me that like there's no way to denote this is back in time without literally going back in in time according to our reference. Because like Patrick Stewart probably literally did wear that when he was a kid. So. <laughs> This is true. It just was weird. It just was weird. Um, Rios, I'm over it. I'm over him. I'm over this cigar thing. I am annoyed by him. And maybe I'm supposed to be. But I just, I don't think they do his character any justice by making him kind of this like two-dimensional cool guy, you know? Like, hopefully... They give him somewhere to go with that because I don't feel like they did that for him last season. Well, I think part of his character was helped last season by having the holograms that were all kind of a part yes. of him. And that's one of the most interesting yes. things about him that's kind of been taken away. So exactly. Yeah. Without those holograms, like, I don't know what his name is, that actor, but as an actor, he has range. He can do a lot. And so him without his holograms, which were the saving grace for him last year, they're going to have to do something to keep me interested in this guy. Um, And then just my last con is really just commentary because, and we've talked about this on the discovery pod before, but I feel like discovery gets unfairly targeted for some of the plot devices that they use that have historically been used by Star Trek and, and they just get targeted for it because here in Picard, we have an impossibly powerful entity that appears threatening the existence of all of mankind and only Picard can save us. And also their leader is probably Picard's mom. So I had better be seeing the same level of scrutiny that Burnham gets for always being the savior. If we're also going to do this with Picard, I will say this Picard for one, I think the mom thing is too obvious, and I hope they don't do it. But Picard is inherently tied to, and this has been written in such a way that when Picard, well, when TNG starts, Q says humanity, you know, the trial never stops. So this is tied into right. Q. So this is kind of like a story arc of one thing, whereas Burnham, it's multiple things every season that are completely different. And divorced from one another. Like, this is a continuation of where TNG started. It's true. Kind of a book. But last season, Picard, it was also tied in to, um, what's that family? Data's, Data's family, essentially. The Soongs. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, they have a full, like, a well to draw from for Picard. Whereas Discovery was kind of starting, in a way, fresh. There was this, the tie into Spock and all of that, but yeah, they could have done anything with discovery. So yeah, they really could have, huh? Anyway, I just had, I just had better hear some criticism of this. If this is how it pans out, that's all I'm saying. People better go there. I'm sure if it's Picard's mom, there. you will hear criticism. Yeah. They that's, were pretty hard on season one of Picard. So it's not like there's not criticism out there, but. Mm. This just feels a lot more earned to me because we know the character of Picard, we know Q, we know that this could be something that happens because Q left things open ended the last time we saw him anyways. So. Right, that's true. <clears throat> Those are all my cons. So I'll move into Picard's speech because I like his speech, but one of the lines he says in there is a future free from the shackles of the past which is like this famous saying from Alex Kurtzman, kind of, where he says, you know, we had to move Discovery forward so we could be unshackled from canon, basically saying an F you to the fans who care about continuity in their stories, that he does not want to, some writers do not want to go through the hard work of knowing the past of the show, so they want to move it so far into the future that they can write whatever they want without having to worry, which I can, without having to, like, contradict I mean, things that have already happened it. yeah so that that line just kind of reeked of that and i was like Ugh. Uh, i don't think that's what they're doing trying to it say this season you can see 
Yeah. yeah. And I understand as a did. writer, like, could you imagine me like, you're going to write an episode of Star Trek and me like, not a Star Trek fan or not having watched much Star Trek. I think most people know what right. it is, but like right. the amount of work and just homework you would have to do to even be able to write an episode is pretty overwhelming. Uh, I would imagine. So, yeah. Uh, I also felt, and not everyone can be Brandon Sanderson. So this is true. This is, if you wrote a season of Star Trek for one, he'd have it done in like two weeks. Right. <laughs> um, but then we'd have a secret season and a movie. Yeah. I, I wasn't buying the Picard Laris thing. I felt that was very yeah. rushed. And Ugh. even just the exposition of that, we're like, I can't believe it's been a year and a half since my husband died. It's like, oh, okay. Oh, man. Well, as long as it's been a year and a half, now we can spring it on you. Like, the timing of it also right. is very weird. Like, we just happened to be catching with Picard. And in a year and a half, Laris has not, they have not tried to hook up. And Picard is completely unknowing like blindsided of, I don't know. by this yeah. anyways no yeah and like i said if, if picard's mom turns out to be a board queen i am out like that is the one caveat to the season that i'm going to be so disappointed you know it's if they true go down that well you know it's true yeah i don't think i'll be out completely but i'll be very disappointed it'll be like the rise of skywalker to an extent where Mm-hmm. Raise nobody, raise nobody, raise nobody. Ray Palpatine is like, no, you didn't <laughs> have to do that. And I think James King also kind of talks about ROS parallels in, in his comments. So we'll talk about that there as yeah. well. But it, just because it's obvious or just because the fans expect something does not mean you should do it. Um, that, is, that is one of the finest examples of, you know, fan backlash from the man babies panning out yes. and then causing more more trouble. But again, as with Rise of Skywalker, that is a perfect example. And New Trek, what fans are they making this for? And I think if you're smart and you're progressive as a writing team and as a producing team, you are going to be seeking newer younger fan bases you're going to be looking for a new audience you're building like a a brand new audience you want to pay homage you don't want to upset fans but also star trek fans have selective memory they like to think about star trek in a way that never existed star trek has always been progressive star trek has always been about talking in allegory, in metaphor, about modern things that were happening. You know, Mm -hmm. you had Star Trek addressing climate change in the 90s when when nobody was talking about that. Or, you know, having gay characters in the 90s when nobody was doing this. Star Wars can barely make that happen now. So the idea that, like, this is new for Trek is ridiculous and not consistent and it's just, it's a fantasy that, that these fans have made up. So I'm not really worried about pissing those fans off. Sure. I, I agree and disagree at the same time because I think there's a subtlety to some of the older stuff, probably because of censors and not being able to just say something. But I think there's a mm-hmm. beauty in that of Star Trek would let you kind of make up your own mind. It's kind of telling you something, but you have to kind of put the pieces together instead of just being like, You should do this. You should do this. You should do this. It kind of shows you an example of what a character does. And then at the end of the episode, you can decide for yourself if they made the right call or the right choice. Um, It wasn't as on the nose. I also feel like you want to bring in new fans. But with Picard, when it's a three season run, I think your target audience is that TNG crowd because The Next Generation was the most successful show on TV when it was out, it was the most successful syndicated show ever. Um, back when syndication was a thing. So you had this huge audience that was in its 20s and 30s back then, or 40s, that's still alive, that still wants to watch Star Trek. And they have four or five other shows to bring in different fans. I think that's what they're trying to do with Discovery and with Prodigy. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, any show is, is smart to try to bring in new fans. But I think you have to kind of pay homage to 
you know, stick with the the girl you brought to the dance in a way and, and honor. Well, be respectful of the origin. Yeah, be, be respectful of the origin and the characters. Like, you have to be true to the characters. I think that's huge. Yeah. I don't really have too many issues with modern Star Trek. I think it's just Mm-mm. some of the writing and discovery is not as strong. And the overall story arc tends to drag out a little bit. Whereas with Picard, I think they've already done a good job of establishing kind of what the story arc is, setting up a second arc of Picard's past and then having a much stronger supporting cast around Picard. Because that's the the one big difference you can you that can That gets take. more time. Because you have Burnham in Discovery, you have Saru. And mm-hmm. really aside from that, especially in season four, there's not uh, there's some other characters. But in Picard you already have an established character in seven. You have yeah. Picard. Very strong, established, very popular. You can bring in character. old characters like Q and Gaina that are already established. Discovery doesn't really have that luxury. They don't have that. Where they're at now. They did that a little bit in season two, and it helped with Pike. Right. Um, but no, I, I'm super excited for Picard. I think this was a really mm-hmm. strong start. And super strong. And I don't know, episode-wise, I'm not trusting I am to be anymore, lest Jeremy... Um, Punish us with probably re-reviewing all of Enterprise. Uh, and the Reels actor's name is Santiago Cabrera. Um, Santiago Cabrera, that's right. But I did want to look up and see if they have an episode list. I know they already started season three of Picard. So this season, they, they say ten episodes, which I know next season of Discovery is going to be ten episodes, so they say. Okay. Um, which it might end up being a surprise episode. I guess, hey, Discovery held surprises too. They surprised us. It's not just Brandon Sanderson, because we thought we were getting 11, <laughs> and we're getting 13. So surprises all around, Jocelyn. Um, did you have any other cons go. for Picard? No, not that I can recall. Okay. So I guess that means... We got to make a little trip. Oh. The, we're going to the. Do you want to go to the basement first? Before what? You know what? The fan comments. The actual fans. Yeah. Or do you want to go to the basement first and get it over with? Let's go to the basement because I think we'll have some more positive comments after we get out of the basement. I think I'd feel better that way. I think let's do that. All right. All right so let's go to the basement and uh, get these. Uh, Negative. Comments out of the way. Um, well, we're here. So, <laughs> into the basement. If you're not familiar, is a segment uh, where every week we go into the IMDb Picard page for this show, and we find the finest one star review that we can possibly find. Which it was a little more difficult with Picard, um, to be honest. But this person felt very strongly about this episode. This comment is from Benjamin Ensor, and the title of his comment is, I'd Rather Have Cancer. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So he says, I'd rather have cancer than keep watching my childhood be destroyed. Um, He takes issue with Picard. Yeah, his whole childhood is being destroyed, uh, Jordan. It's, it's, It's terrible. Picard on a vineyard. It makes no sense to him. Picard was confident in a private man, and now he's frail and apologetic and emotional. Um, yeah, he doesn't like the Romulan accent. He doesn't think seven of nine uh, is cool. She's lost all her logic. He goes on and on and on. Um, but he, he he says it's like watching your favorite pub burn down and also just, again, to reiterate He'd rather have cancer. So I don't know about you, Jordan, but I guess (laughs) speaking as a person who um, like actually had cancer, I just I want uh, Benjamin uh, to know that like, yeah, I get you, man. I I totally get you. Like, oh, you watching your favorite Star Trek show not cater to your every specific need um, and your compulsion to entomb everything you love so that we as a society never progress beyond the archaic norms that you specifically feel comfortable in is so much worse than having cancer. Just so much worse. You're probably over there just just pining for feeling never before levels of fear and anxiety over your own mortality while what feels like shards of glass violently exit your body through your asshole, your hair falling out, your skin flaying off from radiation, the multiple surgeries. You'd gladly endure 
to prevent some woke mob from making you feel uncomfortable about the fact that you have feelings. Yes, Benjamin, cancer would be so much better. You poor, poor man. Woe is you. You truly are the most (laughs) oppressed person in the world. I just just wanted to validate his feelings considering my specific perspective on the matter. So, yeah, yeah. I could agree with that. This poor guy. Yeah, cancer can actually yeah. give you an ensor. So his name is just It's perfect. true. <laughs> I would also say that if you are so frail and fragile that a TV show mm. is going to ruin your childhood, you might yeah. have some bigger, deeper-seated issues going on there. And you still have Gosh. seven seasons and four movies to go back and watch. Yeah. Oh, heavy stuff. Let's get Let's out of get here. Let's get out of the basement. Let's go I to the like top the floor. I don't like the smells down here. To the fan access booth <laughs> where only they can get in. Exclusive membership. Mm, VIP access VIP only. access and a bottle of Chateau Picard is Ooh, waiting for complimentary you. complimentary for your private reserve. Um, speaking of VIPs. Getting into the fan comments, Wayne Fraser says, this is such a promising start. I thought the same thing with the pilot in season one, but this seems to be built on stronger foundations. Let's see where it goes from here. But there was one thing I didn't like, one thing that confused me and one thing that concerns me. I didn't like that they killed off Zaban. Zaban? Zaban. Zaban. Zaban, I think. Zaban. Shaban, I love that bread. Which kind of sounds um, like they, Shaban, which is Michael Shaban. Shaban. Oh, One nice. of the writers. I, I don't like that they killed off Shaban just so Laris and Picard could fall in love. At least give him something more than a passing reference. <laughs> Essentially, they treated him like they did Gerardi murdering Bruce Maddox, <laughs> explained away in a throwaway piece of dialogue. I was confused about the Stargazer. Seven referred to it as a new class of ship based on Borg tech. And less than a minute later, Picard mentioned that these refits make these ships look younger than ever. So is it a new ship or a refit of his original Stargazer? I am concerned that I really enjoyed a Star Trek show that actually had a recognizable Starfleet in it, and now it looks like it's turning into an alt-universe timeline story. Let's hope that Starfleet returns, and quickly. That is true. Like yeah. I like this episode That's so much, true. I am a little hesitant that it seems like we're going into the yeah. the near future slash past. Um, yeah. Near future for us, past for them. But, I don't know. I, I kind of... For some reason, I trust it. I don't know if I should, but I do want to see more of present day Star Trek, like the way that this was. Right. So I hope that that's right. a couple episodes and not the entire season, but we shall see. Mm-hmm. Either way, I'm in. Uh, Chris Royal says comparing Discovery <laughs> to Picard is comparing apples to oranges. It's unfair comparison due to the emotional and historical bond I have with classic next gen Trek. Mm-hmm. However, I'm going to compare anyway because I'm an unfair person. <laughs> I respect that. In one episode of Picard, we had a character we had character development of like ten characters, romance, breakups, the Stargazer, Scientific Anomalies, Borg Queens, Q, Guinan, Battles, Speeches, Excitement, Bravery, Uncertainty, and Twists. Everything Picard gave us in Mm -hmm. one episode. What Discovery has not at all season, which is a reason to watch. Nine but borderline ten. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's him angling for a 9.5, I think. I think so. I think that's an, I'll mark him down for a 9.5. Bre- breaking more rules. Um, Will Flora says, I am intrigued. This had a whole lot of good. Catching up with all the characters, really diving into Picard's serial loneliness, <laughs> explaining glossed over boyfriend murders. It just has it all. The time travel, Borg, and Q give rise to the best feelings of nostalgia, and I need to see what happens next. I just hope they can pull off the rest of the season and not get bogged down by the weight of expectations. And how cool does Rios look as captain of the Stargazer? Uh, And how cool did the Stargazer look? And how (laughs) cool did the Stargazer look? (laughs) Biggest con, no Elnor constantly with Picard? Absolute candor. We got to get the kid a sword. Nine spurned advances. Hmm. Yeah, Justin, I I woke up the other morning and wanted something to eat for breakfast real quick. And I pulled out my box of Cinnamon Toast Crunch. And I guess the kids had eaten it. It was empty. So I, too, 
have experienced serial loneliness. But, oh, my God. Yeah. Jeremy, you can cut that one out. Uh, Laney Boylette says, wow. I loved it. Mr. Laney, not so much. I had to explain everything. Bring on Q. <laughs> Laney, I have to explain everything to my mister as well. I um, had to explain. And then he falls asleep halfway through the episode. Disrespectful. How can you fall asleep during this episode? I don't know. It's disrespectful, and um, we still need to have a conversation about it. Kevin, Kevin, I'm going to butcher your last name, and I'm really sorry about that. Kevin Lung Luang. Lung. Lung. Just say it every way. Lung. And once we find out the right way, we'll edit the wrong ones out. Oh, thank you. Uh, Sorry, Kevin. I've already explained. I can't read good. Um, But Kevin says, I am finally satisfied with live Star Trek. I really wasn't sure that the new producers knew what Star Trek was and could be even. New yet a real story to tell. Loving this again is such a great thing. Orson C.C. Heiser said, I loved it, especially the actual Stargazer. Very cool looking ship. And then Barbara Whipple. Hey, Barbara. Barbara Whipple said, I never really liked Q, but Don De- John DeLancey was spot on. Whoopi Goldberg, on the other hand, did not seem quite like Guinan. However, Jerry Ryan is amazing. Agreed, Barbara. Agreed. James King says, this is a good example of what it's like when you listen to the audience's feedback. A bad example being the rise of Skywalker. While <laughs> I liked season one, this feels like the show we should have gotten in the first place. Loved it. Nine. Doc Ock Borg Queens. Oh, nice. Nice reference. That's totally what they did. Mm-hmm. They Doc Ocked her. Doc her. Um, and then finally, Jeremy Reed says, I absolutely loved this. Watching with Chelsea, I could sense she was enjoying it, but I was practically bursting in embarrassment. An embarrassing, happy tears throughout the entire episode. (laughs) This struck that perfect balance of nostalgia and something new. The writing, direction, and acting was all on point. This mystery of Jean-Luc's childhood and his unwillingness to settle down and let someone in is a very intriguing mystery that can focus in on a very intriguing, I'm sorry, that can focus in on a very much untapped area of Picard's life while also pushing his character a bit further. Q, what an inter- introduction. John Delancey is just so perfect, delivering a Q that's very much how you would remember him, but also giving something a little more, perhaps an aura of fear that I've never really felt from him before. I'm so excited, you guys. This is my era of Trek, finally brought back the way I had always hoped. I liked season one, but I absolutely love this. I give it a nine. A nine, more like Star Geezer. <laughs> Am I right? I'm sorry. Really, though, I loved it. <laughs> And then he says, P.S., I loved when Q did it, but I thought it was a bit unnecessary for Guinan to have to explain her appearance. Then it occurred to me, they'll be traveling to 2024 Los Angeles, so if Picard seeks out Guinan in that time, it would explain her fluctuations of appearance throughout the centuries. Are they really going to 2024 Los Angeles? I didn't know that. Jeremy... (laughs) Perhaps we'll see. Jeremy, you're there, there's going to be me. some travel of time. Ugh, I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah. Unfortunately, Jocelyn, I mean, you can't do a Star Trek podcast without being a little spoiled. I know. I know it. I know it. This is what I signed up for, and I, I accept my fate. Indeed. Well, Jocelyn. Before we do the ratings, I just want to say thank you to everyone who participated on the polls, on the Facebook page. There's a lot of voting on Picard. I think people are very excited about Mm. Picard. Um, There's been a little less excitement with some of the other Star Trek shows recently. So it's really good with Picard and Strange New Worlds coming out. I think kind of reinvigorating some of those fans that have maybe checked out a little bit. Um, So it's just good to have that excitement and just have options for people. Like not everyone's going to like every star trek show i think there are people that you know 90s trek there are people who love d space nine and people who hated it and that those people are wrong but and then there's people who love voyager and love next generation some that love all three so you mm-hmm. know i like all of star trek so far there's really not any star trek i watched that I, I i don't like there are a few episodes here and there there are shows that i like more than others but yeah. it's just really good to have that and to have the interaction and just the feedback from y'all is is fantastic just uh, it's exciting when i log on facebook instead of seeing you know 
some episodes, a couple of comments. We had like 20 something comments on this and a lot of interaction and just awesome. back and forth between the council members and Jeremy. And uh, so it just makes it more exciting to talk about something when everyone else has something to add to the show. So um, if you're on there, thanks for being involved. Uh, if you just want to sit back and read the comments like Book and Tarka and be creepy, that's fine too. So, <laughs> but no, it is time to rate this week's episode. Jocelyn, what do you give mm. the Stargazer? Uh, it was good. It was strong. I have some concerns. So I gave it an eight. Eight bottles of Chateau Picard, aged to perfection and wearing a very classy cable knit sweater just like him. Excellent. I give it a nine. I'll give it nine Oral mm. Grays cold. Oh, and it's very cold in, in space. space. Well, I love I love actually the line. I'll go back just to the episode one more time where Lars is trying to find him. Mm-hmm. She brings him his tea. She's like, do you know how how hard it is to be late in the age of transporters? Yes. Like, <laughs> I felt that. I was like, yeah, I would probably still be late to some things. Right. Yeah. But, oh, man. Like at work, there's a guy who lives five minutes away. And he's late more than me, and I have to drive an, an hour to work some days. So oh my he's God. like, yeah, sometimes it's just so close. It's like, I can get there so soon. He's like, oh, it's already time to be there. I better leave. I'm just like, I hate you so much right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But So anyways, the, okay. the council gives this a score of 8.53, making the overall score an nice. 8.51. And I think IMDb mm. was like 8.6. So like there is a very – Yeah, very high, very strong. Yeah, the consensus is, you know, it was a good episode. So it was definitely better than cancer. I can say that. I, I touche, as has yeah. every episode of Star Trek been. Absolutely. I mean, I just, yeah, it's my opinion. Definitely but. a comparison that should be thrown around willy definitely, nilly. Yeah. Well, Jocelyn, now that we know what happened this week on Picard, let's find out what happens next week on Star Trek Picard. Shall I go first? You shall. Excellent, because I. I'm going to regale you with, I wrote a Delton folk song. And by the way, we didn't oh, talk wow. much about Soji, but Soji's character, she's at this, you know, dinner with the Deltons. Uh, they she are looks amazing. the species from the motion picture. The, the bald woman mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. talks about Kirk ah. unit. I have taken a vow of celibacy. Um, so they're, mm-hmm. I don't know if the whole race is celibate or just the ones that go into space or, cause that guy was hitting on Soji pretty hard at the bar. So, yeah. or uh, Agnes. How do they propagate if they're celibate? Well, I guess it can happen in a lab. We'll find out more about the Deltons, I'm sure. Cause that's mo- <laughs> something I definitely want to explore in season one. Um, For sure. But anyways, they mentioned Delton folk songs, which made me, uh, wonder what a Delton folk song would sound like. So I wrote one, and I'm actually going to wow. perform the chorus right now. Oh my god! I can't wait. Oh, it's gonna be great. Okay, how do you like it? What? Oh, I'm sorry. That's- so Delton's sing at a frequency which is actually inaudible to the human ear. So I've been practicing uh- a lot, and apparently, <laughs> I nailed it. <laughs> Well, I couldn't hear it, so I guess it was accurate. It was incredible, Jocelyn. <laughs> you know what? This has inspired me. Mm. This has inspired me. I am going to deliver my next time on in the Delton style. Oh. Ready? <laughs> Here it is. Did you like <laughs> That's it? That's perfect. That's even right? better than this episode. <laughs> we'll see if I'm right. I can't wait. That is a bold prediction. And quite honestly, <laughs> when it comes true, two, three episodes, four episodes from now, we can go back to this episode, clip it, and play it in the future episodes so everyone can hear how right you were. I love hearing how right the I am. The magic of editing. I mean, Delton. <laughs> Well, awesome, Jocelyn. That that's mostly a wrap for this week's episode. Is there anything that you're looking forward to coming up for episode two, or something that you didn't uh, see this week that you'd like to see explored more? Um, I actually, and I never thought I'd say this, but I am looking forward to seeing more of Gerardi. I, okay. I, I, I want her to be a mess, and I want to watch that um, because it's oh, very entertaining for me. I'm looking forward to the outfits. I love this show has yeah. some of the best fashion of all the treks 
and I love it. And really, there's not a lot not to look forward to. Yeah, I actually, it's we didn't talk exciting. much about the fashion because I, I knew that's kind of your uh, specialty. When I watched I it, I was like, Justin's have a field day with the fashion. I mean, I'm kind of reserving some of the fashion talk. You know, we had a lot to get out this week, but there will be fashion talk next week. Just spoiler alert. Yeah, I liked, um, I mean, my fashion really much just resides in the Star Trek world with the Star Trek fleet uniforms. Uh, so I like the uniforms a lot. I, they're very TNG yes. era feeling, just updated. Mm-hmm. Admiral's, or Picard's Admiral outfit, I thought looked very good. Um, yeah. Which you can't say very often about dress uniforms or Admiral outfits. So, yeah, it's very much in the style and the spirit of, of the next generation. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm sure we'll have a lot of unique fashions going forward and more to discuss other than uniforms, because if we are traveling in time, probably won't be wearing Starfleet uniforms. Also, when you go to like a space casino, maybe don't wear your Starfleet uniform. Maybe don't but, wear you your, your dress uniform. Yeah. But yeah. I'm just, yeah. I'm just looking forward to kind of catching up with the characters a little bit more, seeing more of Seven of Nine. Uh, I think Seven's character is kind of a highlight and we've just seen glimpses of it. We didn't really see her that much in season one. Like she was there. She kind of had that one episode that was more focused on her past with the Fenris yeah. Rangers, but I really like her character and really just any cameos that make sense. I'm assuming we'll see Guinan again and there's a little I bit of so. tie in that they can do. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously the last episode, William Riker will show up to save the day. So I'm looking forward to that as well. I, I, then he better bring Marina Sirtis with him. Oh, naturally. That's all I gotta say. I better see her. I better see Troy. Well, I think that's a wrap, Jocelyn. This was an exciting week of Star Trek, a very exciting mm-hmm. start to season two of Picard. So thank you all for listening to the Star Trek Wars podcast. We will return next week to review the second episode of Picard. Until then, computer and program. Thanks for listening to Star Trek Wars.